so today's material that we covered, um, I'll show you in this video, uh, and really consists of some review stuff, uh, then a couple of theorems, and then you get to the assignment. So if you missed today or you need a refresher, here's where uh, you want to be. So the first thing, so the first thing I want to do is review um, what we just tested over, not a full in-depth review, but the information that we should uh, know about polynomial functions. Okay, so the first thing is that we've talked about how we have to uh, be able to identify a polynomial. Now you have to look at the exponents here to make sure they are, are nice um, whole numbers. Uh, so we're talking zero, one, two, three, four, five, so no negative exponents. Um, so that's how we tell if we have a polynomial. We know its degree is the highest exponent. And when we name these things, my numbering got scrunched up there, we name them by degree and number of terms. Uh, this one up here, for example, we'd call it cubic because it's x to the third. Uh, and we'd call it just a polynomial because it has more than three terms. It's got four terms. If it only had three terms, it's a trinomial, two terms, binomial, one term, monomial. So that's a quick review of stuff that we covered. Here's a third thing. This is the um, fundamental theorem of algebra, and we've been using this all along. And I even mentioned and showed you its name before, but we forget uh, what it's uh, what it tell. We remember what it tells us. We forget the name of the theorem. But just remember that the number of roots and roots remember is a synonym for solutions or the zeros of a polynomial. The number of solutions equals the degree of the polynomial. And the degree remembers that highest exponent that we just saw or talked about up there. Okay. And so uh, it does include repeats and uh, imaginary numbers. And what this means is like if we have an equation like x cubed equals zero, uh, this is degree three, so it's going to have three solutions. And it turns out all the solutions are the same thing. They're just zero. But that's why it uh, fits this fundamental theorem of algebra. Even though all the solutions are the same number, it counts out to three when we count multiplicity. All right, a uh, fourth thing here that we know, uh, rational solutions. Uh, remember the rational uh, root theorem, and that's where you make the list of the uh, p's over q's. Okay. So if we have a polynomial, we could list what the potential solutions were by looking at the factors of being constant. Over the factors of the lead coefficient. I was going to put LC there for lead coefficient. Okay, we used that on our last test. Let's see here. And then five, when we started to solve these things, uh, we talked about graphing a little bit. We're going to explore that more as we go forward here. And that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Then we worked a long time on solving by factoring. And then finally, the really tough ones, we had to factor with a combination of the rational root theorem, synthetic division, and factoring. So that's a quick review of the stuff that we just tested over and all the information that you should know uh, and be aware of. Now, semi-new stuff, okay? This is the factor theorem. We've had the factor theorem before, and it just says x minus k, this is a factor, is a factor of a polynomial, some p of x, if and only if p of k equals zero. And what that p of k equals zero means is that if uh, you put a k in here into the polynomial, uh, the polynomial would end up equaling zero. So it's a solution to it, basically. Okay, so this tells us that k is a solution. So another way to read this and how to deal with this if and only if is to write the statement like this. And this will also make it, I think, clearer for some. Um, if x minus k is a factor then k 
is a solution. And if and only if statements like this one, what that means is not only is it true in this direction, if this, then uh, if this, then that, uh, the flip-flop is also true. So you can re write this thing in reverse, and in reverse it would say, if K is a solution, then, and that should be then up there as well, then uh, X minus K is a factor. Now, the first part here, we've been using this part of the factor theorem. We've checked by using synthetic division. Hey, is X minus K a factor of the polynomial? And if it was a factor, then we had ourselves a solution. Uh, but now we're going to be using this uh, in reverse. We're going to start with, hey, I know what a solution to the uh, polynomial is. So then I know the factors, and therefore I can actually figure out what the original polynomial was. So just to, to kind of summarize uh, this slide here, what you have to realize, uh, if x equals 5 is a solution, then the theorem tells us x minus 5 is a factor. And so that's that k and that x minus k that we're talking about. Okay, here's the k, and this is the x minus k. And so there's the factor that was in a polynomial that gives you that solution. So let's apply this now to solve some problems. So here's a problem where we can uh, uh, apply that uh, factor theorem. They've given us three solutions here, and they've told us, hey, find the polynomial that gives you those things. Well, we just learned that if you have a solution then you know the factor that it comes from. So if x equals 3 is an answer, then x minus 3 is the factor that gives you that. And if negative 2 is a uh, solution, then x minus negative 2, which would be an x plus 2, is the factor. And finally, uh, if 1 is a solution, then x minus 1 is a factor. And that's the polynomial. The polynomial is made up of those three factors multiplied together. Once we multiply these uh, three together, we will have the polynomial that has those three solutions. So let's go ahead and walk through this multiplication here. Some of us have been having a little bit of difficulty when it's uh, three binomials multiplied together. So first, what you want to do is just multiply any pair together. I'm going to start with this pair right here. And this is just double distribution. So you take the x and you multiply. x times x is x squared. And you take the x and you distribute it to the 2. So it's x times 2, which we write as 2 times x. Then we distribute. Let's find a different color here. And we distribute the negative 3. That's negative 3x. And we distribute the negative 3 to the 2. That's negative 6. So that's the product of the first two, and we still have to take it times the x minus 1. What I've noticed on our test, though, is students, after they multiply, is they aren't doing this next step, which is, hey, after you multiply, combine any like terms. And that's going to help you not only uh, solve the problems quicker, but you'll have a better chance of getting them right, because then there's fewer multiplications. So these two are both x terms, so we combine them. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. And now we just have to distribute the x squared to the x, giving us x cubed, and the x squared to the negative 1, giving us negative x squared. Now we distribute this negative x. Negative x times x is negative x squared. Notice how I've lined it up with my uh, other x squared term. And I take my x and distribute it to the negative 1, and that's positive 1x. And then my last distributions, negative 6 times x, which is negative 6x, lines up right underneath this x term. And lastly, negative 6 times negative 1, which is plus 6.
And so there's the uh, end of our multiplications. And now all we have to do is combine all these like terms, and that will tell us what P of X is. P of X is adding straight down. I got an X cubed, negative 2X squared. Straight down is negative 5X, and then plus 6. So that's the polynomial that has the solutions that they asked for. The, uh, what were they again? They wanted it to have negative, oh, three, negative two, and one. And this polynomial will have those solutions. In fact, um, I've got it graphed over here. So I'm going to blow this up a little bit. And what you'll notice is I have graphed two things. I've got several equations here, but only this red one and this purple one are turned on right now. And this is the function we started with, x minus 3 times x plus 2 times the x minus 1. Uh, and here it is in factored form, and it gives you this red line. Okay, that's a polynomial fa uh, right there. And you can see the zeros right there is at negative 2. Right there, there's a 0 at 1. And right here is the 0 at 3. So it does graph and show you those solutions. Now, I also have it multiplied out. That was our answer up here. And you can see the purple one's not showing up on this graph. And that's because the purple one is directly behind this red one because they're the same equations. One is in factored form, one is in expanded form. Okay, now this solution that we have, this is one possible answer for this. And I want to show you why. The only requirements of this question were that uh, you have the, the solutions that they wanted. And so here I've graphed a different pair of equations. I still have our first original one graphed right here. Uh, but now I've got that same equation, but I've put a factor in front of it, a 2. Okay, And because of this, uh, even though I put this 2 in front, it still has these factors in it, so it still has these solutions. And you can see the red one here is the original function. What there's its solutions, negative 2, 1, and 3. And the blue one with that 2 in front of it, it did not change the zeros still has the same solutions, but it did change the y values that come out of it. In fact, you can see it's doubled the y values. That's what that 2 does. So either of these two answers would have worked. In fact, you can put any number in front of this equation, and it'll give you an equivalent equation, an equation with exactly the same solutions uh, as the original. So let's look at the final uh, graph I have here. This one is just reiterating uh, the point again. It's the original equation again in red. And this time, instead of a positive with 2 out front, I put a negative 2. And you can see the graph is completely upside down. But it still has exactly the same solutions. So this is only one answer that uh, is possible. And in fact, if you read the question way up here, it says find a polynomial. Okay, It doesn't say find the polynomial the single one that works. It just wants some polynomial that has those solutions. So we talked about the factor theorem and how we can use that to write polynomials. Here's another theorem. This one's about irrational numbers. Remember, irrationals are everything that can't be written as those nice fractions that we've been writing. Remember doing all that P over Q stuff? Those were all rational answers. Irrationals are things that have square roots in them like root 2 or 5 minus root 6, okay? And not only is this theorem about um, irrational numbers, it's about irrational conjugates. And so we better know what conjugates are. Conjugates are these radical binomials that look like this, a plus some square root. And its conjugate is exactly the same thing, except it has the opposite sign right in front of the radical like that. So those are what conjugates are. And the irrational root theorem, and you can read it there if you want all the uh, formalities of it, but essentially it says that these uh, con uh, uh, irrational binomials, these a plus root b's, and these a minus root b, a, a minus root b's, it says these things always come together. If you get one of these for an answer, you're going to get the other one for an answer, okay? And it just has to be that way. This is a theorem. It's been proven that this always occurs. So if I know, for example, so here's an example. 
x equals uh, square root of, oops, let's make a nice binomial here first, equals 3 plus the square root of 2, then because of this theorem, I also know that x equals 3 minus the square root of 2 is a solution. So once you know one radical solution, you get a freebie because it's conjugate, the one with the opposite sign, uh, is also going to be a solution. So here's a few more examples of different uh, solutions you could have, and then they're conjugates, so you would know what the other one is. So let's say, for example, we had negative 5 minus root, ooh, let's make it minus 2 root 7. Okay, if this is one of the solutions, then you are guaranteed that this is another solution. Okay, so once you know this is going to happen, you automatically know that's going to happen. Here's another one. Let's say, for example, x equals the 5 times the square root of 2. What does the irrational root theorem tell us will be another solution? The conjugate, which is the opposite of 5 root 2. Now, those two do not very much look like this A plus root B business, but if you think of this, uh, when they only have the radical part, if you think of it as 0 plus 5 root 2s, then the conjugate is 0 minus 5 root 2. And so we're just not showing those zeros when we do the conjugates. Now let's look at we can let's look at how we can use this to solve problems. So this would be a typical type of problem where you'd have to use the irrational root theorem. Write the polynomial just like we did last time with these roots x equals four and x equals the square root of two. Now this is where we use the irrational root theorem. Right away when they say, hey, x equals root two is a solution you have to know on your own in your head, write it down, that this is also a solution. Because these have to come in conjugate pairs. First, they have these nice polynomials with these integer coefficients that we've been having. And so one has to be positive. That means you have to have that negative one. And now that we know what all the solutions are, not that they were hiding before, we just have to know that theorem to know that, then we know all the factors. There's one of the factors, x minus 4. Remember, 4 is a solution. That's like your k. And so x minus k is the factor. Root 2 is a solution, so x minus root 2. Negative root 2 is a solution, so x minus negative, which is plus root 2. So those are the three factors that give you those three solutions. Now, this is not a very pretty factorization. We've never had factors with these roots in them. It's okay, but... We'll make it look nicer. Let's go ahead and multiply these two together. These are conjugate binomials. We've dealt with these before. Watch what happens. Now we're going to leave the x minus 4 up there. We haven't used him or anything yet. And I'm going to start to distribute. So here I go x times x, x times root 2, which is x times root 2. Big surprise. Then we've got. Uh, negative root 2 times x. That's just like x times negative root 2. It's negative x times root 2. And then lastly, we've got the negative root 2 times positive root 2, which will be a negative, and the square root of 4. Now, just like all binomials, when you multiply them together, you always want to simplify them before you multiply anymore. So let's see what happens inside here. We've got an x squared term. And then this happens. And this is what always happens when we multiply these conjugate binomials like this. The x root 2 and the negative x root 2, they add up to 0. So they are completely gone from the equation. And all we're left with is minus, and that's the square root of 4. So it's just 2. And that's a pretty decent looking p of x, a polynomial that will give us those solutions. Now, as the last thing, though, if we want to get it in standard form, we can distribute that x, x cubed minus 2x, distribute the negative 4, negative 4x squared plus 8. And then in standard form for our final beautiful answer, we'll just add p of x equals x cubed minus 5x squared uh, minus 2x's and plus 8.
and we're in standard form. It's going to have those solutions. We built that from scratch. Now, I mentioned uh, when we found our first polynomial by using the uh, solutions to build them with factors that, hey, we found one of the possible answers. There could be a coefficient, a number in front of the whole thing that makes it look different, but it would have exactly the same solutions. Okay. Well, in this particular problem, they want us to write the polynomial, not a polynomial. They want the single polynomial that has these solutions, 2 and negative 3, and our polynomial has to go through uh, 4, 12. This notation just means when you put in a 4 for x, p of x, so you put a form for x, out comes a 12. These are ordered pairs. When next goes in, 12 comes out, your y value. So we have to have that, our polynomial do that. But we can go ahead and we can write our, the bones of our polynomial really quick. P of x, this polynomial, has to have the factor that gives you a 2, so x minus 2. It has to have the factor that gives you a negative 3, so x plus 3. That's the polynomial that gives you those answers. Now, unfortunately, I don't believe this one goes through 412. Let's test it real quick. Let's find out what the P of 4 is and see if it is 12. So 4 minus 2, remember, we whatever we're putting in for x, and then 4 plus 3. Let's see, 4 minus 2 is 2, and 4 plus 3 is 7, 14. The P of 4 is 14, so no. Ours has to go through 4, 12, so we're going to have to fix it. Okay, now we can't change our factors. If we change our factors, we change our solutions. Okay, so it still has to have that x minus 2 and x plus 3 in it. We just got to put a little correction factor in the front. To get our parabola, our yes, parabola, because it is going to be one in the right form. So let's just put an A in here and figure out what A is. To figure out what A is, it's going to be pretty easy because we have this point it has to go through. So we force the issue. We say, all right, when X is 4, and so I'm going to put that 4 in for my X. I got 4 minus 2 and 4 plus 3. When I do put that 4 in there for X, I know my answer better be. 12. And by setting this up in this fashion, I can figure out now what the A is that needs to go in front. So 4 minus 2 is 2. 4 plus 3 is 7. That's that 14 we had before. And then we divide by 14. We want to get the A alone here. So you divide by 14. And you get A has to be 12 over 14 or 6 sevenths. And so now we know our full equation. The answer to this guy, p of x, would be equal to six sevenths. And then our factors x minus two times x plus three. So that's what p of x is equal to. We could go ahead and we can multiply this thing out if we wanted to. Okay, so we can make it look in, like uh, in standard form. Depending on the problem and what they want, you would have to do varying degrees of work after this. So x times x, x times 3. Negative 2 times x, 2x, and negative 2 times 3. Don't forget, collect those like terms. And we get x squared plus x minus 6. And whether you distribute that six sevenths, I, I would not, uh, personally, because uh, you just have to factor it out anyway if you're trying to solve something like this. It's nice to know what that A value is, and then it's very, very easy to refactor this if we ever had to. Um, last thing, though, let's check to see if this thing does exactly what we want it to do. We know it's got those right solutions. Let's check again uh, the condition. If uh, we plug in a 4 for x, do we get a 12? That's the question. So let's go ahead and find the P of 4. It would be 6 sevenths times, and I'm going to put that 4 in for x, plus 4 minus 6. Let's hope we get a 12 out of this, otherwise we've goofed up somewhere. And so we'll go 6 sevenths, 
Let's see, 4 squared is 16 plus 4 minus 6. I'm showing you all the steps here, everybody. That's 6 sevenths. And that's a 20 minus 6, 14. 7 goes into 14 twice. And 6 times 2 is 12. So we now know for certain that this polynomial that we found, this guy right here, yeah, he is the correct polynomial. That's it. That should get you through all of your stuff. If you go to the uh, assignment, it is a Google form. Okay, uh, There's only a couple problems that require work. Most of them are just kind of questions about, hey, if this is a solution, which one of these is a factor, so on and so forth. So they don't take a whole lot of time.